We begin our journey in the Isle of Skye, exploring the ancient battlegrounds of rival Highland clans, as well as the geological and historical wonders of the island. Crossing over the sounds, we head to the mainland to see one of Scotland's most photographed castles, the fortress of Aline Donan. Island hopping over rum and egg, we arrive at Mull, and from there we follow the pilgrim's path southward to isolated Iona, the historical centre of Scottish Christianity established 1500 years ago. Then it's back to the mainland where we'll weave through some of the Highland's most spectacular locks and glens, all steeped in Gaelic myths and heroic legends. We finish our journey in the town of Fort William, at the foot of Ben Nevis, the highest peak in the United Kingdom. Some say that the Isle of Skye is conclusive evidence that, as God was creating the world, he was plainly showing off. Right off the west coast of Scotland, Skye is the northernmost island of the Inner Hebrides. Its name derives from the Norse, meaning cloudy island, as it is often cloaked in mist. Skye is composed of a series of peninsulas, splaying out from its centre. The most visited is the peninsula of Trotanish. This is Staffin, off the coast of the peninsula. It is believed to be the last island in Scotland where the farmer has his herd of cattle swim between grazing spots. Trotanish is considered Skye's greatest geological marvel a massive ancient landslide that spans most of the 30 kilometre long peninsula has exposed a series of imposing rock faces and a wonderland of geological formations. The craggy summit of Storr is, without a doubt, the most prominent of these features. And beneath its cliffs is the spectacular pinnacle known as the Old Man of Storr. Like much of Sky, this rock formation is steeped in magic and myth. By some accounts, the island was once overrun by giants, and one of these beings was buried with his thumb still poking out of the ground. Another story tells of a man and his wife fleeing from these giants. When they made the mistake of turning around to look at them, they were both turned to stone on the spot. Ten kilometres west is Dunvegan Castle. In times past, the Isle of Skye was the location of a fierce rivalry between two clans, the MacLeods and the MacDonalds. This castle was constructed during this long-standing feud 800 years ago and has been the seat of the MacLeod clan ever since. Situated on Loch Dunvegan, it boasts a wall garden and a collection of magical memorabilia within. The most prized of these is the silken fairy flag, which, as the legend goes, was gifted to the MacLeods by the mischievous fairies of the island and can be used three times to save the clan in moments of extreme danger. It has already been used twice, once in a battle against the MacDonalds and once to ward off plague and starvation. Further south are the Coolins, the most impressive mountain range on Skye. It is fabled that the sun threw his fiery spear into the ground and where it struck a massive boil swelled and burst its contents over the land, forming these mountains. And the myth is not far off the truth, as indeed this range was formed by volcanic activity, creating these black jagged peaks which consist of crystallised molten matter and the surrounding red peaks formed from granite. The Coolins are prime territory for intrepid mountaineers. All of Skye's 12 main peaks, or Munro's as Scotland's highest mountains are known, lie in the Coolin range. There are plenty of summits to mount, or as the Scots would say, Munro's to be bagged.
A few kilometres eastward is the Scottish mainland, which sits on the other side of the Sky Bridge. Controversial from the start, the bridge was at the centre of a national argument about public transport. When it opened in 1995, the toll, which was expected to be around a dollar in today's money, ended up costing over ten times that amount. This resulted in organised protests, massive fines and a number of arrests. In the end, the residents prevailed and the toll was waived. In 2008, the whole of Scotland became toll-free for bridge crossings a development which Sky residents take some credit for. Further to the southeast is Elaine Dunan Castle, one of the most photographed castles in all of Scotland. Built originally in the 13th century to defend against Viking attacks, it steadily increased in size until 1719. It was in this year that Spanish soldiers, in support of the Jacobite Revolution, garrisoned themselves in the castle to await supplies. The British government bombarded the Spanish for three days, but the formidable five-metre-thick walls forced them to storm the building on foot. Once inside, the soldiers used 350 barrels of gunpowder to destroy the fortress. Elaine Dunan lay in ruins for 200 years until Lieutenant Colonel John McRae Gilstrap bought the site and structure in 1911 and restored it to its former glory. Along the coast is the narrowest point between Skye and the mainland, the Sound of Sleet. The name comes from Old Norse, meaning smooth. But when the waters of Loch Alsh are squeezed through a narrow gap of around 200 metres, the current creates the swelling turbulence we see below. And smooth is the last thing that comes to mind. The subsequent riptide is notoriously dangerous, although brave souls have been known to swim across during calmer spells. Some 25 kilometres south, along the coast of the mainland, is the picturesque town of Maleg. During the 1960s, it was the busiest herring port in Europe. Despite its size and modest population of around 800, Maleg is still the main commercial fishing harbour on the west coast of Scotland, as well as a popular tourist destination in the summer months. From Maleg, you can catch a ferry eastward to the island of Rum, formed 65 million years ago after a volcanic eruption. Although Rum seems an unlikely site for settlement, it has produced some of the earliest evidence of human activity anywhere in Scotland, including tools up to 10,000 years old. Today, Rum is cared for by the Scottish National Heritage Foundation, and most of its 20 residents are involved with the upkeep of the island in some way, which involves caring for wildlife and reintroducing native plants. Just southeast of Rum is the island of Egg, covering around 30 square kilometres and with a mere population of 90, Egg is small but along with being stunningly beautiful and teeming with bird life, it is also the site of a human experiment that has served as an inspiration to people around the globe. In 1997, the residents of Egg collectively bought the island from its long-term owner and have since developed a unique community based on equality and sustainability. The power needs are supplied completely by solar, wind and other alternative energy sources. Dotted with small settlements along its coast is one of the most heavily Gaelic-speaking areas in all of Scotland, the Ardnamurchan Peninsula. It is also the site of the first intact Viking boat burial to be uncovered, complete 
with sword, axe and spear. The interesting geology here is known as a caldera, which is created by the collapse of land following a series of volcanic eruptions, in this case 55 million years ago. And nearby is the fishing port of Tobamori, capital of the Isle of Mull. With 3,000 residents, it is the most populated area in the Hebridean archipelago. Its brightly painted houses also makes it one of the prettiest inhabited spots in the region. The town is surrounded by the rare white-tailed sea eagle, while dolphins, whales and basking sharks are often spotted in and around the harbour. Although present-day Tobermory is only 200 years old, the surrounding area is thriving with romantic history. Legend has it a gold-laden galleon from the Spanish Armada lies somewhere on the seabed, waiting to be discovered. Deeper into the Isle of Mull is the rugged landscape that holds ancient and mystical secrets. A 2010 excavation found remnants of an 8th century Celtic altar and the bones of the hermetic monks that live nearby. Caves are full of Neolithic artefacts and ancient stone circles, as well as 6,000-year-old hilltop forts called Duns are scattered about the mountainous countryside. The island was a centre of early Scottish Christianity due to its proximity to the highly religious Isle of Iona. As a result, medieval graveyards and the remnants of 5th century chapels add to the layers of history here. And to top it off, like most of these isles, Mull was overrun by Vikings until the 13th century. To the south is Loch Nakiel's Island Fill Bay. Centuries ago, this would have been part of the route pilgrims took to reach the Isle of Iona. There are no major settlements along here, and so the area is a prime habitat and popular breeding ground for the white-tailed sea eagle and other wildlife. Isolated off the coast of Mull, this is the last place you'd expect to find a farmhouse. But here it is, on the island of Little Colonse. It was once the childhood summer escape of author Cressida Cowell, who described the island as the kind of place you'd expect to see a dragon overhead. Nearby is an island that's been an important location for Christians for 1400 years. Iona. Saint Columba arrived on the island in 563 AD and under his influence it became one of Europe's centres of learning during the Dark Ages. Iona Abbey is built on the site of Columba's original monastery where holy texts were copied, religious poetry composed and even a guide to the Holy Land written. Kings, nobles, holy men and humble pilgrims travel to the monastery both in life and death. Some to study and pray and some to be buried in the sacred soil. And it still draws pilgrims today. From a later period of Scottish history is this magnificent 13th century stronghold perched on a headland of the Isle of Mull. Duart Castle. It was given to Lachlan, clan chief of the Maclean's, to his wife as a diary, and went on to serve as the seat of the Maclean's for more than 300 years. In 1653, during Oliver Cromwell's reign, a fleet of six ships attempted to ransack the castle, resulting in three of these ships being wrecked on the shores in a storm, and the remaining three turning back. The castle was eventually destroyed in the next century and remained so until 1910, when the 26th chief of the clan, Fitzroy Donald Maclean, bought the site. It has since been renovated 
and been open to visitors since 1995. With the landscape bathed in dappled light, we leave the Isle of Mull. Here, a stretch of sea, known as the Sound of Mull, separates the island from the mainland. Ferries still carry passengers to all the islands we visited so far on this journey. Crossing the Sound, we pass Lismore Island and its distinctive white lighthouse. With a geology of unique highland limestone, a fault line runs directly beneath, resulting in the otherworldly landscape we see here. And amongst these uneven, jagged green hills lived the 146 residents of the island, rearing cattle and sheep on top of these dense layers of history. On the way to the mainland, is the Ard Muknish Bay, where we're reminded of perhaps the most ubiquitous element in the history of these islands, the Vikings. Arriving in the Scottish Isles around 800 AD, Viking ships, like this reconstruction, roamed the locks and seas for 500 years, asserting their dominance through sheer terror and violence. They destroyed the sophisticated kingdoms of the Picts and Scots that had dominated previously, reducing their civilization to rubble. The Vikings were finally expelled around the 13th century. As the water moves at high tide from Ard Muknish Bay into Loch Etiv, it races through a narrow channel and creates this churning white water known as the Falls of Laura. But as we move deeper into the lock, which snakes in land for about 25 kilometers, the waters become calm and enchanting. The mountains of Etive Glen surround the lock below. It is said that the Gaelic goddess Deirdre fled to this glen with her husband Nisha and his brothers. They spent a happy time here hunting and fishing until misfortune finally befell them. But some still believe that you can find their spirits wandering the glen in the form of swans. Here in western Scotland, lush valleys or glens weave through the landscape, each with its own local legend. This is Glen Kinglass, and its story is a modern parable on the ill effects of progress. It tells of a long resident hermit living in this glen who visitors in the 1950s would travel great distances to see. But he was eventually pushed off his land with the construction of the A83 highway. We continue the journey inland between the mountains of Glen Etiv until eventually the grass turns brown and the river becomes a trickle. These glens were carved out by slowly moving glacial sheets of ice that slipped down towards the sea 10,000 years ago. The last significant glacier of the Ice Age once sat here at Rannoch Moor. When it finally melted, the earth rebounded upwards and continues to do so, rising about two to three millimetres a year and as the surface layer of peat dries out, roots of old pine trees dating from the pre-Ice Age Caledonian forests are uncovered. Today, Rannoch Moor is one of the last great wildernesses in Europe. The land here is composed of blanket bog, peat, rivers and rocky outcrops sitting atop a bed of granite. This makes the land extremely difficult to develop and so it remains a sanctuary for wildlife. Like its neighbours, Glencoe was also carved out by the movement of giant glaciers. It is well known as the legendary home of one of the great Gaelic heroes, Finglan. He is hailed as the warrior who finally drove out the mighty Viking invader, 
King Aragon. After the time of Finglan, the Glen eventually fell into the control of the MacDougall clan, who built up a small empire here. It was taken from the MacDougalls after they fought against Robert the Bruce, the liberator of Scotland in 1308, and handed to the MacDonalds, who were allied with Robert. The MacDonalds stayed in the Glen for 300 years before suffering a bloody massacre here in 1691 at the hands of their long-time rivals, the Campbells. Having thought a peace had been reached, the Macdonalds offered the Campbells hospitality and lodging, much to their misfortune. For that night, the Campbells carried out the massacre, killing 40 Macdonald men in their sleep and setting the rest running to the hills to starve to death. The waters of Glencoe run westward and drain eventually into the majestically lit Loch Leven. The waters of Leven then squeeze into the much larger Loch Linny. At 50 kilometres long, it is one of the biggest lochs in Scotland. Travelling northward, we arrive at the second most populous settlement in the Scottish Highlands after Inverness, Fort William. The name pays testament to its history as indeed the town grew up around a fort built during the English Civil War to keep an eye on the local population. It was then used to quell Jacobite uprisings in the early 18th century. And named in honour of those very same uprisings is the Jacobite steam train. The locomotive carries passengers from Fort William daily, taking two hours to reach the fishing town of Maleg. The route was completed in 1901 in an attempt to open up the remote western coast and to increase trade with towns like Maleg. For the next 80 years, the line was rarely used and as a result, heavily subsidised by the government. Having been replaced by diesel engines, no steam trains were in use on the line until 1984, when British Rail reintroduced the steam locomotive in an attempt to boost tourism and bring revenue to the line. And it worked. These days, the scenic ride is described by some as the greatest train journey in the world. Passengers enjoy spectacular views of many of the islands we've seen on our trip, as well as Scotland's deepest loch, Britain's highest mountain, and scenery from movies like Highlander and Local Hero. And not only do passengers see locations from popular movies, they get to ride in them too, because the Jacobite steam train stood in for the Hogwarts Express in the Harry Potter movies. But perhaps the most impressive sight on the train journey is Ben Nevis. Looming over Fort William at 1,350 metres, it's Britain's highest mountain. The name Ben Nevis is an anglicisation of the original Gaelic, which is translated both as the malicious mountain, or more comfortingly, as the man with his head in the clouds. Its first recorded ascent was completed in 1771. But now the mountain is an extremely popular climb with over 100,000 ascents a year. A perfect place to end this journey. <laughs>